Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Oh, Krishna. Hare Krishna. Oh, Krishna. 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 Hare Krishna, what have we got ourselves into? When most people think of the Hare Krishnas, they immediately imagine orange robed, shaven headed monks chanting down the streets. But Hare Krishnas do so much more than that. They chant sitting on the streets. Chant in yoga studios. They chant in halls. Chant in their homes. The list is endless. But seriously, there is a lot more to the life of a Hare Krishna than simply just chanting. Though, that is an extremely important aspect of it. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. These two Hare Krishnas just want to have a bit of fun. To give you some insights on what it's like to be a Hare Krishna. Well, at least a Hare Krishna in New Zealand because the Hare Krishnas are a diverse bunch of people. We would love to hear what your experiences have been like with the Hare Krishnas. So please don't hesitate to comment below. But we better let you go, as you're probably really eager to explore our videos. Let's talk about being a Hare Krishna. Today I wanted to share a video with you I made a few months ago. It's about how my mum feels about me being a Hare Krishna. Now I can understand some of her concerns because I took a year off uni to completely immerse myself in the philosophy. Why do humans have this ability to question? It's a swami. If I survive. I'm gonna find out the meaning of life! We live to eat, isn't a plan to see? I might not have been so great with communicating and spending time with her, but I've grown up now! Anyway, here's the one minute video about my mother. So I don't really know what my daughter's doing these days. I think she's chanting and doing quite a bit of yoga, which is good. Uh, I do worry about her being involved in a cult kind of religion but I'd be equally as worried if um, she was being a Catholic. I know she's learning quite a bit, uh, getting a bit of philosophy but I don't think it's the be all and end all that she thinks it is. I wish that she would call more often and come and see her dog Kess. I can understand you know she's busy with her study so she's back at university which is good and she's also busy with the community. So I do worry about her future, um, I just want her to be happy like you know, most parents will want their children to be happy. We do have some interesting debates sometimes about life and the meaning of it all, but I do love my frustrating thrill making Hare Krishna daughter. <laughs>
Krishna plates. Everybody come and get your Krishna plate. Five dollars, ten dollars, what you got to lose? Fuck! It's over there! Curious about the Hare Krishna lifestyle? What is it that you'd like to know? We've dedicated this entire video to answering those questions. One minute, 21 questions. Why'd you become a Hare Krishna? Boom. What does it mean to be Hare Krishna? To give Krishna to others. Hey, excuse me? Who's Krishna? He's the supreme source of all pleasure. What are you wearing? A sari. Why do you wear a sari? Because I look pretty. Oh. Are you wearing face paint? No, it's tila. What's tila? Sacred uh, clay from the Ganges. Why do you make videos? To share my lifestyle. Why do you sell books? To share spiritual knowledge. Why read the books? To get spiritual knowledge. What's the difference between spirit and matter? Matter is temporary, spirit is eternal. Do you meditate? Yeah, two hours a day. What does your meditation involve? Chanting Hare Krishna. What's the biggest problem in the world? A uh, consciousness problem. Why are we suffering? Because we don't understand who we are. How does chanting Hare Krishna help? Because it elevates our consciousness so that we can understand who we are. Why are you vegetarian? I practice non-violence. What's so special about your food? It nourishes both the body and the soul. What makes you happy? Oh, chanting and dancing. Why do you chant and dance? To make me happy. We're on Shiva Street, chanting Hare Krishna. And you can see the ecstatic party going on behind us. Oh yeah. Let's come and join. Come and join. Wait, you probably won't see this till like a week later, but next time you see us, we're here. Today is my birthday. Happy birthday <laughs> to you. Another year older, another year wiser. You don't have to punch him. Kill him. Though my views about violence haven't really changed, many other things have. Aw, oh, honey. Grunts so much! This really hurts my abs. Yeah, it really hurts my whole being. <laughs> Science tells us that every seven years, every cell in our body changes. So basically every seven years we have a totally new body. Which means that I have changed bodies three times in my life. Me as a kid, I still think chocolate is more yummier than peanuts, but peanuts are pretty high up there. While my body is totally different now, I'm still me. I might be more intelligent, hopefully, but the essence of who I am remains the same. Check out this picture I drew. We all started here, right? Started growing, changing bodies every day and every year until we end up here. But through that process, part of us remains the same. So some call that the soul, others call it consciousness or the self. The practice of bhakti yoga is to explore the science of self-realization. Because the more you understand about yourself, the more you can relate to other people, the world around you, and you'll find far more inner peace. And without inner peace, you can't have happiness, right? We like, like to party. party. We, we, like, to we party. like to party. What party are we talking about again today? Hmm. There's been so many. I think the last party we went to was the one in Auckland. Oh, yeah. The road trip. Woo! How long did it take? Like nine, nine, nine hours. House in the From car. Wellington all the way to Auckland, but it was worth it. <laughs> we held a big party for our spiritual teacher.
it. So there's basically no one on the street. So I'm getting a little delirious. I think I'd look for ways to entertain myself while I wait for one person. Uh, so it's a little wet outside, it's quite hard to sell books to people when the books are getting wet. <laughs> you know sometimes you'd think that saying the same thing over and over again for like four hours would get really dull. I'm from Wellington, just traveling around showing everyone these books about happiness, stress-free living. Have you heard of stress? But there's something really satisfying when you have really nice exchanges, conversations with different people. You know, I just did um, Bhagavad Gita and Heidi and Unnatural Happiness to a lady and she was so appreciative. So it's the end of another day today, and again I'm pretty tired. You know, sometimes I don't really realise how much energy you're actually giving to people when you're stopping them talking to them on the street, or well, most of the time people just walk past me and just said no. But still, you give a lot of energy doing that. So therefore, you get a bit tired at the end of the day. I'm trying to read, but it's proving difficult. You know, I'm trying to read the books that we're distributing, but I'll see how we go. <laughs> Usually, I ain't on your shoes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so this is what a Hare Krishna with a broken nose looks like. <laughs> <laughs> this, <laughs> this, this is actually a window. <laughs> Not an open door. <laughs> so that little black lonely car to the right there, that, that's our van. And Mundrunjan's in there sleeping. Um, or trying to sleep. But it's a little bit difficult. So, I've been a bit crook the last day and a half or so yesterday. Um, Alright, so I'm on the street of Rotorua, a little bit apprehensive, two days being in bed, sick, and hopefully I meet some really nice special people. Bedroom. Our kitchen, as well as our laundry and our washing line. So this is our dining room. This is where we're going to have a shower in the morning. It's about 5am and a little cold. Wonder Aranya says my sh my socks look funny, but I reckon I look cool. Hare Krishna soul sister! Uh Lavanya, there will be boys watching this too, you know. Oh, right. That's true. Okay. 
Harry Ball spread soul! Is that better? So the other day I was watching TV, right? And you'll never believe what happened. I could probably just show you, actually. Good evening. I'm Ron Burgundy, and this is what's happening in your world tonight. What are you thinking? You are boring me to death, and I am already dead. To call ourselves the Three Musketeers. Who's the third? Oh, Angela Simpson, but she left us for another click. Like who, the Fab Four, the Magnificent Seven? Mm, no, the Hare Krishnas. <laughs> Sometimes I see her at the airport. Hey, now... Oh, great, no calves. I have a gift for you. Thanks. No thanks. You said it was a gift. Yeah, right. <laughs> Why does everyone only know us from the airports? Get in, get in. Only because you made my dad part of my job. Good point. You haven't seen him in years. He flies across the Atlantic to see you. Pacific. You breeze by him like he's a Hare Krishna at the airport. You don't even ask why he's in town. Have you heard of Krishna consciousness? This part is a crazy man. I don't understand your obsession now with dog shows. It's like when you became a Hare Krishna and then changed your mind halfway through the haircut. <laughs> oh, come on, Joni. Ever since I retired, I've been kind of just like feeling weird. You're gonna look like Harry Krishna. <laughs> That's funny. <gasps> Are you okay? Ah, I love scrubs. A month ago, I shaved my head to show solidarity with a leukemia patient. Of course, there were ramifications. Hello, I'm your doctor. Oh, no, 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 I know I've got the hair, but I'm not one of you uh, people. Hello, how are you? Well, I have been known to timbre. After our tambourine jam, they gave me some literature, but I'm not the type that's easily sucked in by that stuff. Morning, Dr. Dorian. Praise be to Krishna. <laughs> Does that mean my soul would pass to another human Ooh. being, or would I come back would as a moose? Would he ever move for the Harry Take our literature, uh -huh. read it over, and think about it. OK, thank you very much. You're welcome. Hare Krishna. Who are you kidding? You're gonna be a Krishna? You're gonna shave your head and put on robes and dance around at airports? Again with the shaved heads and bed sheet references. <laughs> Hare Krishna! Hare Krishna! But you like a Hare Krishna fist on your throat, you little punk! <laughs> You're God? I'm Tracy, I'm your caseworker. What is this? How disappointing. Come with me, please. No, thank you. Thank you. Fairy Krishnas. <laughs> That's really original. I like that one. I, I don't know what I'm Fairy wearing. Krishna. <laughs> what are you wearing? Well, Stephen, everybody needs support. Like this one time, I left the supermarket in a really bad mood, and then I met these very nice people, the Harry Krishnas. <laughs> They sang me a song, they gave me some rice. It was just a little pickup I needed. <laughs> you know, if I hadn't had to make dinner, I might have gotten into their van. <laughs> yeah, Mrs. Pullman. Black Hare Krishnas. Yeah, those freaks were hassling me once, too. So when they weren't looking, I stole five boxes of Thin Mints. <laughs> Kelso, those were Girl Scouts. <laughs> After the show, I spoke with the singer. He tried to hand me a pamphlet about Hare Krishna. I said, you got to be kidding. Who the hell is this blue guy? <laughs> so true. I mentioned a lot of people think that. And then he said something special. Can't wait to start the facial reconstruction, see if anybody reported a blue man missing. Krishna has been depicted as having blue skin, but he died in 3102 BCE, so decomposition would be a little more advanced. <laughs> had enough of this it's gotten a little strange what i found a little troubling was that subtle hint that Hare Krishna was a kind of crazy dressing up in bed sheets and chanting on the street and i've realized it's 
time to get serious. We don't simply hit the streets, dancing around to the beat. This lifestyle is very scientific, some may say quite specific. We learn the difference between body and soul, then confusion will never take its toll. We are very careful what we eat, fruit, veg and grains, but never meat. Our aim is simple, know thyself. All you gotta do is uh, look at our bookshelf. The knowledge you'll find is one of a kind, because we learn the difference between the soul and the super soul. In that way, confusion ain't never gonna take its toll. Matter can satisfy me, promises me it would be Everything I wanted, but leaves me dried out and empty Where's the ocean of pleasure? I, I hear it can be measured That nothing could be fresher than reconnecting with Krishna Krishna! That was a sneak peek into a new song that a friend of mine is working on at the moment and Hold on. My spirit soul is transcendental, so what's the use in getting mental? It's not made to enjoy material things, nor does it experience suffering. The false ego combines body and soul, keeping you separate from the supreme whole. It's just an illusion of the mind, making sure that you stay blind. When you experience this mess that we like to call happiness and distress, don't worry, in your mind you'll find the key to unwind this grind that isn't even one of a kind. Rather than adjust your external situation, try and change your internal information. Cause we are spirit souls. These bodies are just temporary molds. So fly in the spiritual sky. Experience that natural high and chant. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna, Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Rama Rama, Hare Hare. It's cool, right? What do you think? Comment below and let us know. Who knows? We might make it into a real song. Since this video is about Hare Krishna rappers, I thought I might share another video I've just done. You see, Samya and I are natural born rappers. We rap about things if it really matters. Like how yoga isn't just about bending and stretching. It's about something deeper than what they're teaching. Through yoga's about the soul, body and mind. Let's take it deeper and see what we can find. Sounds pretty juicy. Tell me where and when. Student Union, 217, Thursday night, 510. Yoga and philosophy combine the two and it's yoga philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I can pull off gangster quite well. Real education is a mystery to most as we go about our lives, leaping, texting, eating, cross. We know exactly what we look like in a killer selfie. But we understand. wondered how this all began? It all started with this man. I made this video because I am often quite embarrassed about my association with the Hare Krishnas. Because let's be honest, they can look kind of different and behave kind of differently. Hello, I'm your doctor. Oh, no, 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 I know I've got the hair, but I'm not one of you uh, people. Hello, how are you? Well, I have been known to timbre. <laughs> This is something I've actually wanted to do for the last like four years. And now I've done it. <laughs> I wanted something that I could point people to and say, look, this will give you a fair idea of what the Hare Krishnas are all about. The word Hare refers to the divine feminine potency of God. Krishna means the all attractive one. 
and Rama is the reservoir of all pleasure. I hope you find it interesting and informative. I obviously couldn't go into detail about a lot of things, but I feel like it kind of hopefully gave a pretty clear overview on what the religion's all about because not many people really know. Bye. It's time for the moment you've been waiting for. Have you ever wondered how this all began? It all started with this man, Srila Prabhupada, when on October 9th, 1966, he and his followers came to Thompson Square Park in New York to chant Hare Krishna outside for the very first time. And it grew from there. While Srila Prabhupada brought this chanting to the West, it was really introduced by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu of Bengal, India in the 16th century. Sri Chaitanya emphasized the worship of Krishna and believed that in addition to chanting the names of God, of which there are many by the way, they should also be chanted on the streets for the spiritual benefit of all. Hence why you see Hare Krishna is always chanting on the street. Chanting means to keep association with God always. So you have to audibly Chant, yeah. Hare Krishna. Yeah. This is this is uh, transcendental, transcendental vibration. This transcendental vibration or chanting is called mantra meditation. Mantra means to deliver or free the mind. The word Hare refers to the divine feminine potency of God. Krishna means the all attractive one, and Rama is the reservoir of all pleasure. Hare Krishnas or Bhakti Yogis or Vaishnavas or Devotees, these are all names for the same group of people chanting on the street. They believe that the sound vibration of the mantra has a direct impact on the soul, that it helps to spiritually awaken us like an alarm clock wakes us in the morning. Devotees believe that a person doesn't need to understand the language of the mantra. They believe that the sound vibration transcends the sensual, mental and intellectual levels of consciousness and puts one directly in touch with the spiritual. At this point, you might say, who cares about the spiritual? Well, everyone should care about the spiritual because we are all spirit souls. Let me elaborate. When you were born, you were a small baby, obviously. We grow from a baby to a child to an adult and hopefully into old age. Throughout that whole process, you are still you. You might gain some new skills, learn a new language, but it's still you doing that. You are driving your body. When I say this is my dog, this is my car, this is my hand, or this is my leg, I'm saying that I own these things. But these things aren't actually me. I am separate from them. If you saw me lying dead in front of you, I would imagine you would cry. Well, I would hope that you'd cry and say something like, She's gone! But in reality, my body would be right there in front of you. So really, the part of me that makes me me has actually left. Now that part of us some call our consciousness, the self or the soul. It is beyond physical perception because it's spiritual. If you understand this basic concept, then spiritual things might seem a bit more important, right? Because you would understand that you are actually spirit. This is the Hare Krishna's foundational understanding of life, that we are all spirit souls. There is no Hare Krishna without that understanding. The understanding that we need to awaken our spiritual awareness and identity. But we don't just have this life to do it in. When our body ends, our soul continues on to a new one. Until we become spiritually awakened enough not to take a material body again. Instead, we would go beyond this material world. But that is a whole other explanation, perhaps for another video. Now, this is not a sectarian faith in a lot of ways, because devotees have the understanding that when they pray to Krishna, or when members of the Abrahamic faith pray to Allah or Yahweh, they are all praying to one and the same person. This is my mother, or my mum, as I call her. Now, her first name is Judith, but she goes by Linley, or Auntie, or Auntie Linley, or Sister, or Miss Hutton. She has a lot of labels, but is still my mum. Just because we call someone by a different name doesn't mean we aren't referring to the same person. 
I'm going to illustrate my next point using some scenes from a cute animation called Little Krishna. This is Krishna, the supreme personality of Godhead. Also known by other names, remember, the Vaishnava faith, or the Hare Krishnas, are monotheistic. There is ultimately one God, but he can expand himself however and whenever he pleases. You might be wondering, why is he a small boy? Why is he blue? Why is he playing the flute? All good questions, but again, that's really another video in of itself. But if God can create this whole world, if he can create you and I, then why can't he do other things too? According to the sacred texts such as Bhagavad Gita or Srimad Bhagavatam, Krishna oversees millions of demigods who are seen as administrators of universal affairs. These demigods are needed to run creation. They have a certain role, but just as the Secretary of State reports to the President, these demigods serve for the pleasure of Krishna. It is for that service that devotees strive for. Now we serve people every day. Our mothers, our fathers, bosses, friends, partners, anything we do for them is a service. This service can bring such great joy. It's our nature to serve. And that's because we were originally servants of Krishna or God, but have fallen asleep, so to speak, and forgotten about that service. On Mother's Day, I used to love making my mum a nice breakfast in bed of pancakes and coffee. Sometimes I'd get her a newspaper to read or flowers too. I did all this because I wanted her to be happy, and doing that made me happy. This is similar to serving God, but on a much deeper and ever-growing way. Srila Prabhupada is the perfect example of a servant. He was fixed on love of God. How else could someone of his age come to a foreign country, travel the world 14 times in 10 years, while also transcribing over 60 volumes of ancient Vedic texts to English, as well as training disciples, opening temples, and managing an ever-growing spiritual movement? As a young man, his spiritual teacher always encouraged him to write spiritual books in English and go to the West to teach people about the importance of chanting Hare Krishna. It wasn't until he was 69 in 1965 that he could board a boat called the Jaladuta and fulfill his teacher's request. He had translated the Bhagavad Gita in the very beginning of Srimad Bhagavatam, which is rather long by the way. He hoped to finish translating the entire series of books before leaving his body. Srimad Bhagavatam consists of 18,000 verses, spread over 12 cantos, which totals to 18 books. To put this into perspective, for some, the Bible consists of 23,145 verses in the Old Testament and 7,957 in the New Testament. Although the Bible has more verses, Srila Prabhupada also has commentary on almost every verse to help us with our understanding. He references numerous other texts from the Vedas, which is a large body of ancient Indian religious texts, by the way. What makes his work so nice to study and read is the fact that he has the original Sanskrit followed by the transliteration so that those of us who can't read Sanskrit can at least pronounce it. Then he has a word for word translation, then the whole translation, and then a purport. Unfortunately, he never managed to finish the entire Srimad Bhagavatam. He got to Canto 10, part one of four before leaving his body. But as I said before, during the 10 years he was transcribing, he was traveling the world, opening temples, looking after disciples, and also translating other books, such as Chaitanya Charitam Rita, which is 11,519 verses. This book teaches about Sri Chaitanya's life and his devotion to chanting Hare Krishna. That is a lot of translating he did before leaving his body on the 14th of November, 1977, aged 81, 11 years after he first left Indian shores to spread Hare Krishna in the West. And he certainly left a legacy. Most Hare Krishnas are part of an organization called ISKCON, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Srila Prabhupada incorporated this on the 13th of July, 1966, to formally begin teaching the West and the world about chanting Hare Krishna. For you to be officially part of ISKCON, there are a few requirements, six to be precise. There are four core regulative principles. The first is no meat eating, including fish or eggs. The second, no illicit sex. The third, no intoxication, including tobacco, caffeine and tea. And the fourth, no gambling. These principles are to help you stay focused on your spiritual practice, with your consciousness as clear as possible. I could go into details about those principles, but again, that's really a whole nother video in of itself. So those four regulative principles need to be followed, as well as number five, chanting Hare Krishna. The official number is 16 rounds. A person uses mala beads, which consists of 108 beads to chant the entire Hare Krishna mantra on. 
The mantra is Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And that is to be chanted another 107 times to chant one round. 16 rounds is considered the daily chanting standard, which can take between one and a half to two hours. Once someone is consistently doing this every day, or even before they reach 16 rounds, they should look for a guru. So number six is to find a spiritual teacher and take initiation from him or her. Last year it was officially announced that women can become initiating gurus, which is fantastic because it shows real growth for the society. Yes, I do believe that religions should grow according to time, place and circumstance. The essence of the philosophy is hopefully not lost, but some of the practical things could be altered according to what is normal in society. For example, women. In India, women were never allowed to be priests or on the altar doing deity worship. But when Srila Prabhupada came to the West, he allowed women to do those things, which was heavily criticized by Indians. But he knew that in order to grow his society in the West, he had to make some practical adjustments without losing the essence of the spiritual practice. When someone takes initiation, they vow not to eat meat, to refrain from illicit sex, not to take intoxicants or gamble. And they also vow to chant a minimum of 16 rounds every day. That makes a person an official Iskand devotee, and they also receive a new Sanskrit name, like Lavanya Kaili, which was my name, to remind you of your service to God. Lavanya Kaili Devi Dasi, for example, means the servant of Krishna's pastimes of beauty. This is the religion that Srila Prabhupada brought to the West over 50 years ago, which stems from an ancient spiritual practice. And this video is the Hare Krishna movement in a nutshell, as much as I could. I hope you found it clear and informative, and thank you so much for watching. I am no longer a Hare Krishna. past two years I've debated whether to make a video about why I left because I just didn't want to rock any boats. But I have really, really struggled to make sense of everything and I thought making a video might help me process it all. I've struggled with depression and anxiety for a little over four years. I struggled for two years when I was a Hare Krishna and about two and a bit years since leaving. It has been crazy difficult. I was part of something that made sense to me something I loved, but my mental health just kept getting worse and worse. So I decided to leave. I will eventually talk about why I left, but this video is actually about why I joined. Then I'll make a video about each year I was a Hare Krishna before talking about leaving. I want to stress that these videos are not about slandering the religion. They are my reflections and I want to be as respectful as possible. Growing up, I was not a religious person. It wasn't something I even really thought about. If it did cross my mind, I would always wonder if God was so great, why did such terrible things happen in the world? Let me give you the briefest overview of my upbringing, because where you come from and the experiences you have greatly influence the choices you make in the future. I came from a broken home. My parents separated when I was four and my brother nine. We saw our dad every second weekend and he would often take us on amazing camping trips and school holidays. He met my stepmom when I was 11 and they married when I was 13 and I have three step siblings. When I was 13, my brother left for university. After that, we had international students come live with us, so I had company at home. Otherwise, it would have just been mum and I. We've gone over to Europe to visit them since, and one of them came to my brother's wedding last year. When I was in high school, I had a good circle of friends. I loved music, and we had a band. I was creative and enjoyed art as well as playing football. I also developed a passion for making videos. My first was a musical, which I wrote 
about two footballers trying out for the first 11, but not getting in because they ate too many pies. I love those years at high school. Then we had to decide what to do with our life, and university seemed the thing to do. Because I'm creative, I decided to study design, and I happened to receive a scholarship for Victoria University. I didn't like it, and I moved to a much better design course at Massey Uni. Now because some papers cross-credited, it meant that I had six months in 2012 that I didn't need to go to university, so I decided to travel abroad. By this time, I was vegetarian, and I didn't drink alcohol. I was extremely concerned about our environment and saw meat consumption as a significant factor in pollution. I travelled a little of Europe, I woofed, which means voluntary work on organic farms. Then I had a family holiday in France. My brother had been in Europe for over a year and didn't want to spend another winter, so we both went to India. I was intrigued by the idea of meditation and learning more about myself, so I thought India would be a cool place to explore. India was tough for me. It was just such a contrast to my Western way of life. When I got home, I became quite contemplative and rather depressed. I just didn't see any hope for the world. When I was traveling around Europe, I came up with the idea to open my own vegetarian cafe that provided locally grown food, mainly on the property, and would also teach people in workshops how to grow their own food. I gave myself 10 years to make this a reality. I knew I needed more experience in hospitality, but I would only work in a vegetarian restaurant. There happened to be two in Wellington at the time, and one of them was a yoga studio that provided a vegetarian meal afterwards. It was called Bhakti Lounge, and that is where I met the Hare Krishnas. After the first yoga class I attended, the yoga teacher made two announcements. First, that in a month they were running a yoga retreat an hour outside of Wellington. And secondly, they were looking for someone to design and build a new website. Given that I was becoming interested in meditation, the retreat sounded amazing. Also, I was studying design and thought that making a website would be a really great experience. Now before we continue, it's important that I take you back to when I was 15. My dad owned a retreat center called Wahunga in Otaki. I loved that place. I even did a photography project there and got high distinction for it. What is crazy is that it turns out that for two years this Krishna community held their end of year retreats at my dad's place. What's more is that the Krishnas had been donated a property just up the road from the one my dad had owned, which is where their upcoming meditation retreat was being held. So that was my first coincidental connection that I had with the Krishnas. I ended up designing their website in exchange for free yoga and dinner. So I was going there four times a week and loved it. When I went to the retreat center, I fell in love with it as soon as I got there. It stirred up so many dreams and I saw many possibilities to grow vegetables and teach people to grow their own food. I loved that the community was vegetarian. None of my friends were at the time and I felt like a bit of an outcast because of that. Yet here was a group of people who were vegetarian and also seemed to care about the environment. On the retreat, I was introduced to Japa meditation, and it just grabbed me. I remember sitting on that bridge and thinking how nice it was, how relaxed I was. After the retreat, I would chant Japa every day. There was this one Krishna lady on the retreat that looked so familiar it was bothering me. However, when I was offered this book called Perfect Escape, I realized that I had the exact same one at home, and she was the one who'd given it to me a few years prior at a bus stop. Once again, I felt connected to the community. This connection was further reinforced when I met up with a group of people straight after the retreat to trial as their videographer. They were traveling the country to film incredible vegetable gardens at schools as well as people's homes. I had answered an ad at university to cover for someone who was going away for a week. It just so happened that one member of the team was also a Hare Krishna. So I started chanting Japa at the retreat or chanting Hare Krishna, and I simply continued on this trial afterwards with the Hare Krishna that was with me. I was so surprised by the weird coincidence of it all. Then she gave me a book that really hooked me. It was called Divine Nature and talked about how being spiritually aware can help the environment. That is what ultimately made me interested in the philosophy 
because it could help me in my desire to save the world. This book was my fuel to find out more. Another book that caught my attention was The Higher Taste because it talked about the importance of vegetarianism and my mum had it at home amongst her cookbooks. Yet another coincidental connection to the Hare Krishnas. Now soon after I read Divine Nature, Deva Marita Swami, the guru or spiritual leader of the Wellington community, came to town. In a workshop, he asked me what I wanted to do in my life. I said I wanted to help the environment. He asked how I would do that. And I said through videos. He then said, what would you put in those videos? I wasn't sure. He said that you can't help the environment unless you understand yourself and your place in this world. Once you do, then you will naturally work in harmony with nature. I was in awe of him. He just knew so much. And not just about spiritual things, but also worldly things. So those were the key events that led me to starting my Hare Krishna or Bhakti Yoga path. I hope you found it kind of interesting. Uh, thanks for listening and have a good one. Eh? This is my third attempt to try and film this. In my previous In my previous video, I explored why I joined the Krishnas. And now I'm going to talk about my first year as a Krishna. The year was 2014. I was 22, young and quite naive. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Welcome to my first Krishna Conscious video. I hope that made sense. I don't know if it did. I'm gonna go have a swim. Something happened in those first 12 months of being a devotee that had a huge negative influence on my future decisions as well as my mental health. You still might be wondering why I'm making videos about leaving the Krishnas when this channel is all about promoting the religion. Hare Krishna. I don't think that these videos are actually against the religion. If you think that the happy Haris are ecstatic all the time, then you're mistaken. Devotees have difficulties, they have struggles. Some push through and thrive in the practice and others, like myself, don't. Since I've left, I've actually taken all my videos down on this channel twice and then changed my mind. It's because I didn't feel comfortable having myself representing a religion when I was no longer part of it. So I decided if I'm gonna keep those videos up, then I also want a series of videos explaining why I left and where I'm at now. I wanted to be honest. Ultimately, I'm making these videos for myself as a process of reflection and hopefully closure Videos just happen to be a medium that I can express myself with. If these videos could inspire conversation, or if they could inspire reflection on yourself, or your involvement in a community, or how that community could better support someone, then that's just an added bonus. Let's first go back to where I ended my previous video, in 2013 when I was 21. Welcome to my first Krishna Conscious rant. Class. Teaching. Class. Can't be a class. I, I'm barely a student. I went to the yoga retreat, started chanting, and didn't stop. I was in my third year of a four-year honours degree in design, with my focus being on videography. One assignment I had was to reflect on a documentary, so I chose to reflect on the age of stupid, where one of my future mentors kindly played me 50 years in the future. It wasn't until a few years later that I realised how much she hates being in front of the camera. But she did it for me, because I was excited by the project and I was interested in Krishna consciousness. In the same class, we had to make a documentary, and I was determined to do mine on the Krishnas. It just so happened that a devotee who had recently moved to the community had had a headache for 20 years. And that was a really interesting hook that would be perfect for a documentary. So I just accept now that my life started 20 years ago and that's the, those are the memories I've got. Um, and it's like I can remember, it's like reincarnation, I can remember a little bit from my past life, but not much. I like to remember things from this life. In my past life I used to look kind of like I do now. Oh actually, no, not really. I used to look different before actually. It seems that because my personality changed as well, then my, my appearance took on my new personality. So I worked on this documentary for quite a few weeks and was coming to community events more and more often. I 
loved everything about this community, and I really wanted to explore the spiritual way of living further. So I asked if I could move into the ladies' ashram. It's enlivening, isn't it? An ashram is like a spiritual community living together, or a household that has a spiritual focus. I still had a year to go on my degree, but I really wanted to take some time off to focus on my spiritual life. So this was a pretty big decision because I put my studies on hold. My family were obviously concerned, but they were pretty supportive. It's important to mention that at this time, my older brother was also becoming quite interested in the philosophy. He was chanting, and we both went to the end of year retreat together. It was a spiritual recharge festival that went from Christmas to a few days after New Year's. As usual, the community would start chanting around 5 a.m. Then there would be a morning program of prayers and kirtan. Followed by that, Dave Marita Swami, the community's spiritual leader or guru, would give a class on the philosophy. Then we would have breakfast, some downtime, lunch, and another class in the evening, followed by about two hours of kirtan. It was exhilarating, and I felt like I had found my place. Now we're in 2014, and I'm 22. I'm living in the ashram and I'm loving it. And I just want to give you some insight about our lifestyle at the time because we were actually living in the yoga center that we volunteered at. There are five rooms at Bhakti Lounge. The first is the serve out area and eating area, which looked a little different in 2014. Then there was more eating space, a yoga room, the kitchen, and a workshop room. Back then, this room was divided in two, with workshops and kirtans held on the left and the ashram on the right. There were three cubbies with desks, and some of us slept in those, and the rest were in the workshop room, but we were all in one big room. I always managed to sleep through the snorers because I was just so exhausted by the end of the day. And the reason was because those days were just so action-packed. A typical day for us ladies in the ashram was getting up early. You had to have a really quick shower because there was one between, I think, eight or so of us. Then you'd put on tila, which is a sacred symbol of a Krishna practitioner. Then you would put on a sari and sit down to chant 16 rounds of the Hare Krishna Mantra, which took between an hour and a half to two hours. If you want some more information about chanting, you can just look at some other videos I've made. At 7am, we'd have morning prayers, which included kirtan until 8am. <laughs> followed by a class on philosophy until 9. Just a little disclaimer. Pretty much none of the footage in this video is actually from 2014 because at the time I didn't really take any photos or videos of our lifestyle. We would then all have breakfast together and do whatever service had been rostered for that day. One of the ladies would be rostered to cook our breakfast and make our lunch in the morning. The service you might be doing varied from day to day. Um, Bhakti Lounge was open for yoga and dinner or a special program and dinner Sunday through to Wednesday. So that meant ladies were rostered to tidy and prepare for the evening, to cook dinner, to greet guests, serve out the food and do the dishes. I mean, it wasn't just the ladies in the ashram who did those things. There was also a men's ashram who helped, married couples, as well as volunteers who did it in exchange for yoga. Now, Krishna Food served out delicious meals at Vic Uni during the day too. I loved Krishna Food because, remember, I had my 10-year plan to run my own vegetarian restaurant, so I saw working at Krishna Food as invaluable experience. Another type of service was book distribution as well as giving out flyers promoting Bhakti Lounge. Just folding some flyers, you know, gotta let people know about Bhakti Lounge. Yeah, man. There were other services too, like making the roster and management, as well as things that I can't really remember right now. On the roster, we were also, as much as possible, given at least two hours free to read every day. That is a huge focus of this community, reading, studying, and understanding the philosophy for your own spiritual growth, as well as learning how to preach the philosophies to others. I was the youngest practitioner at the time, both in age and experience, and I had the nickname Baby Calf, or Calfling, which I kind of liked. Now at that time, this Calfling wasn't very experienced in cooking, but cooking is a big part of Bhakti, so I had to learn. <laughs> One time, I was given the service to cook breakfast for the community on Saturday mornings, so decided to do porridge because, you know, it's relatively easy. I was cooking for 40. And I thought cinnamon would make it taste really nice. But being super inexperienced, I decided that a cup of cinnamon would be really good for 40 people. It was not. And I think many devotees left quite hungry that morning. I did get better at cooking. 
Anyway, my main service at that time, much to the envy of some of the ladies I think, was making videos. I was so enthusiastic about making videos to teach people how to live in harmony with themselves as well as nature. The irony is that this series of videos that I'm working on now kind of illustrates how much I wasn't in harmony with myself. We just decided to come to you and just ask you one really important question. Why do humans have this ability to question? That is indeed a good question. Dave Marita Swami encouraged me to make a video every fortnight. He stressed not to get caught up in the details, but just keep producing and refining my skills. He then asked me to film him whenever he was in town, giving a five minute short talk about the philosophy. That was an experience that I relished, but also terrified me because I didn't want to mess it up. I mean, I did in many ways. Often the framing wasn't great or the lighting very good, but he always said just to keep on practicing. So that was my main service. I got a lot of time to work on these videos. And that's why I had my own little cubby, because I needed a desk and some space to work. I think I made about 15 videos that year, which were intended to be talking points for presentations at Krishna Outreach programs. It's also really important to talk about my love for Kirtan and the Mridanga. Now the Mridanga is an ancient Indian drum, which is considered like the heart of Kirtan. In our community there was someone who was really good at it, who kindly taught myself and some of the ladies the basics. My goal and dream was to become good enough to be able to play Mridanga in the community or at outreach events and play Kirtan that was really fast, enlivening and upbeat. It took a lot of practice, but I eventually got there. I, I got pretty good. Another service I was involved in was to help run working bees out of the retreat centre an hour outside of Wellington. I did this with my mentor at the time, who was pretty pivotal in me becoming a Hare Krishna because I admired her so much. She was so spiritually grounded, sincere and knowledgeable, but also materially very capable and very practical and I really loved that. So her and I worked together to organize the retreats. That service was really important to me because of my passion for learning how to teach people to grow local food and also my 10 year cafe plan. I just loved the service. We would take people to the retreat centre once a month, for free, in exchange for their help on the land. First, we worked on some vegetable gardens, then we moved to creating and clearing tracks around the property. The guests would be cooked for, and someone would teach yoga every morning. This was a super exciting year for me. Everything was new and interesting. I was learning so much, and I became pretty fanatical. So much so that I would refuse to eat any food not cooked by a Hare Krishna. So that meant when I met up with my family for lunch or dinner, I would just sit there watching them eat. And that created quite a big gap between us because sharing food is very, I think it's very important for building and maintaining relationships. I was so fanatic that I didn't even eat chips and I basically grew up on those. I love them. During this fanatical time, I developed a really unhealthy connection or obsession with a male devotee. This is quite ironic given my staunchness about everything else. He was super charismatic and gave me a lot of attention and made me feel like I could do and achieve anything. He once told me that when he first saw me in the community, he thought, I've got to get to know that girl. And at first I was kind of flooded and then realized that he specifically put himself in situations so that he would accidentally bump into me and say hi and make me laugh and that is not okay. We were both told numerous times to stop talking with each other, but we didn't. I just couldn't control myself and I had this raging internal storm inside me because I was so conflicted. I knew that I shouldn't be talking with him, I shouldn't be so mesmerized by him, but I couldn't stop myself. After months of this internal struggle and not being able to talk to anyone about it or be open and honest because I was ashamed or guilty, eventually we stopped talking. Now obviously I've been super vague about who he is and what kind of relationship we had because that's not what was important. What was important was the effect that that experience had on me. I felt such anxiety and anguish because I was so conflicted inside and I felt trapped by the situation. 
I also began having trouble breathing. It became shallow and difficult to take full breaths. It felt like there was something in my throat. And unfortunately, this is something that continues to this day. Every time I get slightly stressed or anxious, I, I tighten up and I really struggle to breathe. I did two things after this experience. The first was to cut my hair short for the first time because I really just wanted to change. I didn't want to be the person that I was before. The second thing I did was to go to Australia to be with my dad and stepmom because I just needed distance. I needed space to think and reflect. I still wanted to be a Krishna, but I just needed some time. Basically the same day I arrived in Australia, Dave Marie Daswami, who had supported me throughout this whole thing, reached out and asked me to come back to Wellington in two weeks because he'll be in town. I wanted to show my sincerity. I was desperate to prove my sincerity, so I came back. I never talked with anyone about that devotee. I never expressed what I thought he meant to me or how I felt by the whole thing. I just kept it all inside. I brushed it under the rug. And that was a huge mistake. But that's hindsight for you. And realistically, at that time, I probably wouldn't be able to express myself or help myself to heal. That healing started a few years later. So that was my fanatical, enlivening, and pretty dramatic first year of being a Krishna. I don't really know how to end this video. So... Just have a good one, eh? Cinnamon challenge, take one. Tell you, how was that? Zero. Welcome to year two of me being a Krishna devotee. It's 2015, I'm 23, and this is the year I get my Krishna name, or get initiated. Let's go back to the start of the year. My mum and I weren't talking for a number of months, and I can't exactly remember why. It probably had something to do with me being fanatical and quite intense. During that time, I had this really big rash all over my legs. And interestingly, as soon as my mum and I started talking, the rash disappeared. I got a phone call from my mum one morning while I was doing yoga. My grandma had passed away. I deeply loved my grandma. She was the most soft, loving, caring, and kind-hearted person I knew. <laughs> I am the winner. Hip, hip, hooray, hooray. I went to the funeral, and while I was sad, I didn't really express those emotions. I tried to see things through a spiritual lens, tell myself that it's fine. She's just moved on to another body, and we'll have another life soon. It's totally normal. But I was kind of callous and cold because of that view. I didn't mourn like I should have. I truly cried for my grandma only last year in therapy. I actually recorded myself reflecting on that session shortly after because I needed to for uni. So um, I explained how grandma meant she symbolized unconditional love. Um, And uh, Nikki asked what she meant to me and if I missed her and I said, I, just, I didn't. So I guess, I don't know, I just, I haven't consciously thought of her because when I, um, when I see Winnie the Pooh I feel, I feel loved and I feel cared for. Um, so it's kind of like she's not gone, even though she is, and I have so many, so many fond memories of her. 
I don't have any bad memories of her at all. Let's go back to the ashram. We have now moved into a new flat just up the road from Bhakti Lounge. It's got four bedrooms and there's about three of us in each and we have bunk beds. So we're not sleeping on the floor anymore. Unfortunately, I didn't really take any footage of the bedrooms at that time. We had our usual morning programs there. I've gone back to study full time to finish my honours degree in design. We had a new ashram leader who I had a special relationship that involved a lot of bantering and arguing. For quite a few months I really struggled because I'd come back to the ashram for lunch but it was super, super average. Now we had a lot of rules that we had to follow. So I always saw prashadam or spiritually blessed food to be really important. So if it's not tasty and satisfying then I found myself being quite disturbed. Another thing I struggled with was that the ashram leader at the time was quite unavailable to talk if the ladies needed to because she was really just focused on her own routine. A lot of us felt quite unsupported at the time but it changed and it's an experience that we can just learn from. So I was doing my honours degree and I had this terrible mentality where I thought I was better than everyone else because I was a devotee and living a pure spiritual life. It was like I was superior to them somehow. I was judging them harshly, which made me kind of bitter and frustrated, instead of loving and kind. I decided for my honours project I would create videos that presented ISKCON, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, in a more approachable or modern way. This is because I've always felt that ISKCON is quite dated in both its branding as well as general mood. It's stuck in the 70s and isn't really moving with the times. I'm sure some people might strongly disagree with me, but if the philosophy wasn't presented in a modern way, then there's no way that I'd be practicing Krishna consciousness at this time, nor would a lot of the ladies in the ashram. Anyway, it was because of my studies that this channel came to be. Hare Krishna! And because Ishri was such a great presenter and loved acting, I asked if she wanted to be involved. Hare Krishna! About a third of the way through the year, a lovely devotee from South Africa came to the ashram. Often we would have ladies from all around the world come for some training for a year or two. But the flat that we were living in was full, so she had to sleep at Bhakti Lounge. It had been renovated since we lived there last year, so no longer had that sectioned off space, and I could see that she was having difficulty. The ashram leader at the time had a room to herself, and I asked if I could share with her. Really just to sleep, because I was at uni all day and studied in a different place, so I'd just be there in the evenings, but she didn't want to. That was probably largely because of our argumentative relationship, I would imagine. So I decided to give up my bed in the ashram and move to Bhakti Lounge myself. I really just wanted her to have the best experience she could. I started to struggle with sleeping at Bhakti Lounge because it often meant quite late nights because I had to wait to guest left before I could actually go to bed. Eventually my mentor at the time kindly offered me a room underneath her house. She even lent me her scooter for me to get to uni easily. Yoga. It's a word many people know. It's a thing many people do. Around this time, I was told that I could get initiated at Srila Prabhupada's 50th anniversary of arriving in America. I was super excited because this would be the next step in my spiritual journey. However, I soon found out that on the exact same day as my initiation was supposed to be was my grandmother's burial ceremony. Now I had to make a decision. It shouldn't have been a hard decision. It was between family or spiritual life. I agonized over it for weeks, if not months. My arguments were always backed up by scripture in my head and I saw that I've had so many families and so many lifetimes because I believe in reincarnation that this was just another family in this lifetime, so it wasn't as important as my spiritual practice. My spiritual life was the most important thing. I also told myself that the burial didn't really matter because I'd already been to a funeral, I'd already honoured her death, but it did matter. 
ultimately this wasn't about my grandmother. It was about supporting my mother who had lost her mother. And yes, I might have had thousands of different mothers in previous lives, but I have my mother in this life and she She needed my support. She had supported me through my whole life. She had raised me. And she needed me. But I chose to get initiated instead. I actually could have gotten initiated in a few months time, but my pride took over. Because some other ladies were also getting initiated who hadn't been practicing as long. So I didn't want to get initiated after them. It was stupid, petty, and a silly decision. I know that your spiritual life is important, but so too is family. I let my mom down. She raised me and sacrificed so much as a single mother to look after my brother and I. And I am deeply, deeply sorry for not supporting her on that day. So I did go to the festival and get initiated. Everyone knows Leah. <laughs> <laughs> the spiritual journey thus far has been very interesting. <laughs> it's her sincerity that has brought her through. Sincerity and determination. And we thank all the mentors that she has for guiding her through various seas. Your new name is <laughs> Lavanya Kelly, Davy Dawson. I was obviously conflicted, but everything that I did, I thought was backed up by scripture and was the right thing to do for my spiritual practice. I finished up my year at university quite disappointed because I got second class honours instead of first. In the first semester I was getting straight A's and A pluses, but because I was just so emotionally distraught or conflicted in the second half, I was very distracted. I began working on a brochure to introduce the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is basically an extended and more in-depth version of the Bhagavad Gita. It's really long. I was making the brochure because one of the leaders in the community invited me to travel around the country to try and sell Srimad Bhagavatam sets during the famous Christmas marathon. This is a time where Hare Krishnas all around the world would focus on trying to distribute books before Christmas. Now before being a devotee I had this dream to travel around New Zealand to get experience working on different farms for growing vegetables. So the idea of traveling in a van was really exciting. Also I idolized the devotee I was traveling with a lot because she was just so kind and loving, selfless and clearly loved Krishna. She was also really amazing at leading Kirtan. I just wanted to be exactly like her. So we traveled together for two weeks, going to different towns, doing these programs, as well as distributing books on the street. This was the first time I really distributed books. I was super, super nervous. On week three, another lady joined us for the remaining two weeks and we all squeezed in the back of the van. Welcome to our bedroom. It was an adventure. And they did actually get quite good at distributing books. I had plans for the following year. I really wanted to focus on making these videos for this YouTube channel as well as develop a website introducing Bhakti in a modern contemporary way. Basically like Bhakti Lounge but online. But I was convinced to move back to the ashram and really focus on my spiritual life for a few more years. So I did. But more about that in the next video. Thanks for watching and have a good one eh? Welcome to year three of me being a Krishna devotee. I'm back in the ashram doing service full time. So in exchange for our spiritual training, a roof over our head and food, we all volunteered full time at Bhakti Lounge, the yoga center, as well as Krishna Food, which is a catering business. So as well as distributing books, we're also uh, gonna show people where Krishna Food is. Hopefully people will come from here. 
to here. I was pretty solid in my spiritual practice at that time. I loved studying the books. I had read all of Srimad Bhagavatam and was starting on Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, which talks about Lord Chaitanya, who advocated the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra. I am a super organized person, so was given some management responsibilities. I started managing the ashram's finances, which wasn't too hard because the flat we lived in was owned by a devotee, so our rent costs were quite low. I started to manage Krishna food, which I really love because remember my 10 layer plan was to run and own my own cafe, so this was a fantastic experience for that. I also started to manage the marketing at Bhakti Lounge, so making the posters, making sure that the posters are distributed all over the place as well as put online, other things like that. I'm a graphic designer, but in terms of marketing, I really didn't know what I was doing. But I did try to do some courses online. At this time, Krishna food was a kiosk on one campus at Vic Uni. But this year, we expanded to another smaller campus. Usually the ladies volunteered at the kiosk, but with a second one, we were spread too thin. So we decided to pay those who served out there. We hired some devotees, but also employed two other people to help serve out and prepare the vegetables. This meant I had to create a contract and set up a payment method where we paid taxes. I didn't really know what I was doing and messed it up. One employee got angry and threatened to take us to employment court or something like that. It wasn't good and I was super stressed. The feedback I was given was to be more diligent, but I had no idea what I was doing. So that's quite hard. So I, I lost a lot of confidence then. As you can imagine, I was pretty busy with these different management services, and I was a little frustrated because I didn't have much time to make more videos for this channel. I, I made some, but I wanted to be more consistent. It's good to be back. Today is my birthday. Why do you always do that? It's not funny. I began leading Harinam, which is the chanting on the street. Lavanya Kaylee, check it out. What? It's us. I also got much better at the Madanga, the ancient Indian drum. I do want to mention Soul Feast, which is a program we run on Sunday nights at Bhakti Lounge. It was always the highlight of my week. I really loved it. We would start with a slow, mellow kirtan with everyone sitting. Then there would be a presentation on something to do with the philosophy, followed by a kirtan that was a little bit more upbeat where people would dance. Then you'd have to wait in a super long line for dinner because the program was so popular and the food was really good. And after that, we would have another rocking kirtan. The program was just so enlivening. Sometimes at Soul Feast we would put on a play before the talk which gave the presenter something to kind of reflect on or talk on. The girls in the ashram were very creative and throughout my years as a devotee I was involved in quite a number of those plays. And in every single one I played a man. I like to think that it was because I was a really, really good actress. Joy, it's great to have you on the show. How are you? I, I'm quite nervous. If I survive, I'm going to find out the meaning of life! Oh, here comes my customers! Oh, pretty good job, this one. 100% death rate. Oh, okay, we were already robots before, now we're going to be real humans. Come on, we've got to find that time traveler. This was also a time where the ladies who were initiated Learn how to do puja or deity worship. It's a very devotional and ritualistic aspect of bhakti where you offer different paraphernalia to the deity or the, the murti. I won't go into details of it in this video though because it's not so important. But it made me feel like I was really going deeper in my spiritual practice. I also started giving class. And that's something that I really pushed for because I wanted to get more experience in presenting the philosophy and hopefully become expert at preaching. This was also a time where I became a little bit more relaxed in what I ate. I would always offer it to Krishna, but it didn't always have to be cooked by Hare Krishna. So when I go to my mom's, she would kindly make me a meal without onions or garlic. Vegetarian, but that wasn't a big deal because my mom's been vegetarian my whole life. But I saw that her removing onion and garlic from what she would normally cook was an act of devotion. So I was totally happy to eat that food and I loved it. Being able to share a meal together was super important for maintaining as well as growing our relationship while I was a devotee. 
Towards the end of the year, the ashram made a trip to Auckland for Dave Maria Swami's birthday. It was about a nine hour drive up. Then we would sleep at the Hare Krishna school, which was next to the temple, and spend the day celebrating his birthday. We would then drive back the following day. It was another blissful yet exhausting experience. And now we come to the end of year Christmas marathon. So we've had our first night on the marathon. Now we're going to go on our first day of books. I was lucky enough to go traveling again and I got to go with someone who really loved distributing books. So the thing is, I might be really apprehensive about going out because I get nervous and people might be real mean to me, which they were. Some people were mocking me about being a Hare Krishna. Um, but there's something really satisfying when you have really nice exchanges. I just did it because it pleased the ashram leader who I went traveling with last year, as well as my spiritual teacher, Dave Marita Swami. We're on day two of the marathon. I'm ready to fight today. And we're going to show everyone these books, which should hopefully be fun. <laughs> okay. Excuse me. Hey, I'm from Wellington. I'm just turning around showing everyone these books. I look cool, right? So this is our evening routine of making our bedroom up. Welcome to my kitchen. I'm making what's called kitchery, which is pretty nice. Some veggies, some spices, ginger, rice, and ki kidney beans. Mm. Mm. This is so exciting. I got wraps today. Wraps for breakfast. Yum. Not bad. To be honest, I really like the adventure of traveling around giving books, but my heart was more into making videos to present the philosophy in an easy to digest way. Maybe that's why I ended up leaving. We'll find out in a few more videos. Thanks for watching and have a good one. Eh? Welcome to year four of me being a Krishna devotee. It's 2017 and I am 25. This was quite a significant growth period for the ashram because we moved into a much bigger flat just below the flat we were living in. This was also the year that I started having doubts about being a Hare Krishna. During the Christmas marathon the year before, I was busy sorting out the tenancy agreement for the flat that we had just secured. I would be the head tenant and I was super anxious about the cost because it would go up about sixfold what we were previously paying. We were moving in at the end of January, which was about the time that I was going to India. There was a lot to do then because the place was really dirty and quite run down. So this is the state of the room, the apartment to begin with. This is our lounge room. We managed to borrow some money for the deposit as well as a few weeks rent. So that helped kind of calm my nerves a little bit. Devotees often said that Krishna would provide but I never thought that he would provide anything without me also endeavoring. I couldn't just sit back and wait for the money to appear. So for months I worked really hard trying to get different catering jobs at festivals or weddings. And it was exhausting. So we're here at a fair and it's a little wet. Unfortunately I did not ask for help during that time. I just shouldered that stress and burden myself. I even damaged my right wrist from carrying too many heavy buckets to and from the van. And that's given me trouble for years since. So that time was pretty stressful. Let's go back to when we move into the new ashram. It was pretty run down, really. And we got permission from the landlord to rip up the carpet because it was moldy in places and quite gross. And we also got to repaint the whole place because again, it was quite moldy and just very, very dirty. There was a devotee who helped tirelessly with the renovations for three days and there's no way that we could have done it without him. He helped move the really heavy cupboards, rip up the carpet, relay the carpet. It just wouldn't have been able to happen without him. So thank you so much to that devotee who has actually since left the religion. 
We had to have the ashram livable by the time myself, the ashram leader and two other ladies left for India. So that meant three days before our flight out were very late nights, finishing after 10 o'clock and then getting up the next morning around 4, 4.30 to chant and then work the whole day. The night before leaving, I was up till about midnight working on some marketing things to carry over for the month that I was away. And I think I got maybe one or two hours sleep before flying out at four in, in the morning. Devotees would call this a yagya or a sacrifice and it certainly was. I had a better experience in India than when I went with my brother a few years prior. I didn't do much filming because I just wanted to focus on my spiritual practice. A few devotees recognized me in a temple there because of this channel, which was quite a strange experience. When some devotees found out that I was a disciple of Dave Marinda Swami and connected to Bhakti Lounge, they really criticized that community, which was super confusing for me. They didn't like this modern, contemporary approach to presenting the philosophy. But I wouldn't be practicing had that not been the style, nor would a lot of the other ladies in the ashram. I was all about presenting bhakti in a modern setting. Check out this picture I drew. We all started here, right? That experience did disturb me a little bit. It made me feel quite disconnected from ISKCON as a whole. So there was a lot to do when we returned to New Zealand. Dave Marina Swami was really pushing for me to explore online marketing more, like Facebook. I felt a lot of pressure because of the financial situation. Our outgoing expenses had increased dramatically. I was also struggling with Krishna food and all the catering I was doing. I remember once a devotee who was the Krishna food chef, who's been the chef for years, once forgot to deliver something that was quite important. And I was furious and sent him this really intense text. And he replied saying, you know, you might be right, but you could learn to be a little bit nicer about it. I was crushed. I felt so guilty and realized that I'd probably behaved in similar ways in other situations as well. I was becoming bitter and frustrated when I thought devotees weren't really thinking properly in their services. And as a manager, that's not really a good attitude to have. I'm supposed to support them, but I was just becoming grumpy at them. I did ask for help at that time. Uh, it wasn't really given. Maybe it was given, but in a way that I couldn't really accept or grasp onto. So I felt pretty alone and unsupported. My health was beginning to become quite bad at this time. I was just constantly fatigued. My iron and B12 were always low, which is probably because I was so stressed constantly. This was also when my depression began. And depression is your body saying, F you, I don't want to be this character anymore. I don't want to hold up this, this avatar that you've created in the world. It's too much for me. Right. You know? You, know, you should think of the word as depressed as deep rest. Mm -hmm. Deep rest. Your body needs to be depressed. Mm -hmm. It needs deep rest from the character that you've been trying to play. So I just gave up. I burnt out. I gave up all my services. I just couldn't cope with the pressures. I didn't think I was really made to be a manager because I felt like I needed to control everything rather than delegate. And because I just got frustrated with people too easily. Come on! Speed up! How do I open the egg? I don't know how to... Useless! I felt like a complete failure. All these years I was trying to prove my worth, prove my sincerity and I couldn't do it. I know it was hard for my mum to see me struggle through these times. And that's because whenever I went to my mum's, it was usually when I was completely exhausted and just needed a break. So she always saw me at my worst, at my most stressed. So I do worry about a future. Um, I just want to be happy. My parents will want their children. We do have some interesting debates sometimes about life and the meaning of it all. But I do love my frustrating for making Harry Christian daughter. This was also the year where I started thinking about marriage and having a family. We had a system in the community where if you wanted to get married, you would put your name on a list and you would be matched with someone else on that list. I was matched with someone in the middle of the year. Let's call him Tom. He wasn't initiated and was from Canada. Tom seemed nice enough, but I didn't really know him because I'd just seen him around the community for a few months and I really just wanted to take my time to get to know him. But he thought I was being quite aloof. Two weeks after we first started seeing each other, I gave my first selfies talk, 
which was a huge thing for me. I'd been wanting to do one for years. So I was really excited and also super nervous. And I normally don't speak in front of a lot of people. I normally speak in front of a camera. So I make a lot of vlogs. So it's a lot easier speaking in front of a camera because I've had to make a mistake. I can just pause it and then repeat what I'm going to say. But in front of a hundred people, it's a little different. So then I'm also a rapper, uh, which is really exciting. I rap about things if they really matter. After the talk, Tom asked me to come with him to the yoga room because he needed to talk to me. He didn't mention the talk, he didn't congratulate me, didn't give me any feedback. He just, it, it's like it didn't even happen. And then he spent, I don't know how long, 15, 20 to 30 minutes trying to express himself, but he couldn't find the right words. Basically, he was saying that he felt like I wasn't making much of an effort in this relationship. But it had been two weeks, so I was, I was a bit confused. I was immediately hesitant to continue, but very much encouraged to, to stick it out and try for a little bit longer. But these kind of things just kept on happening. He would view me as this really amazing devotee, but at the same time constantly criticize me. It was very conflicting and, and really confusing. He also once told me that if we broke up, he would leave the community and leave Krishna consciousness. So I felt quite trapped. Around October, it was suggested that we have a two-week break just to give ourselves some personal time. Tom was the one who really wanted it, and I think I was the one that really needed it. So we went to Auckland for Dame Rita Swami's birthday celebrations, and on the day that we were coming back, Tom messaged me saying that we don't need the two-week break, he's fine, he's cleared his head over these last two days. But it had only been two days, and I needed a bit of a break. So we got into a, some sort of an argument, and he sent me a text that really stuck with me for years. He said that I have a reputation in the community for being obstinate and self-absorbed. That really hurt. I forwarded the text on to three senior devotees and one sympathized and the other two said, oh, well, you know, maybe it's something you could work on. Maybe it was something that I needed to work on, but at that time I needed support. I needed some love and, and sympathy. And that's because I viewed that text as meaning the community hated me and they all criticized me and I had been trying my hardest to give everything to Krishna. <laughs> Given up years of my life in full-time service. On that drive back I really questioned why I was devoting why I was part of this community. I've never had these kind of doubts before, but I had been miserable and stressed for months and so, so exhausted. And I was wondering whether it was worth it. I was particularly offended by the comment about being self-absorbed because I felt like I had sacrificed so much for the community, given up so much of my time and my energy for Krishna. Now I hear that the community is criticizing me. I thought everyone didn't like me. Now it was explained to me sometime after that the self-absorbed comment really just meant that I was quite absorbed in my own services, in my own little world, making videos and things like that. And that's probably true. But I think with the service aspect, I was so over my head and so out of my depth that I didn't know what to do. I just had to tunnel vision and focus on them. I couldn't think of anyone else at the time. Basically, I thought no one would want to marry me, so I should just stay with Tom. Okay guys, you just want to go sit in a dark, dark basement <laughs> and wait for tomorrow? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I soon moved out of the ashram with another lady. Oh, it'll be so much fun! And started working at a garden center. I hated it. I was super stressed about what to do for a career, what I should do for work for the rest of my life. After moving out, I also felt really isolated from the community. At the time, there was only really ladies who were married or single ladies in the ashram. There were no single ladies who were working. So me and my flatmate were quite alone in that sense. I was miserable and things with Tom were not helping at all. I tried breaking it off a few times, but he kept on convincing me to stay. Eventually, I did end things at the start of the following year. So that brings us to the end of my fourth year as a Krishna devotee. This was the year that I started having doubts. Thank you for watching and have a good one, eh? Now we come to my final year of being a Krishna devotee. It's 2018 and I'm 26. <laughs> I 
was no longer living in the ashram, but I felt really isolated, like I wasn't really part of the community anymore. I was totally lost. Lovely day, isn't it? Wish I could say yes, but I can't. I had no idea what to do as a career, and that really scared me because I wanted to be financially stable. I decided to break things off with the devotee I was seeing, which was really hard to do because he kind of wouldn't accept that I wasn't happy with him. I wasn't happy in general, but being with him really didn't help either. The weekend before I actually broke it off, I stopped chanting. I didn't want to live. I knew I couldn't take my own life, but I still didn't want to live in this life. Dave Marina Swami heard that I had stopped chanting and asked me to come see him at the retreat centre. He was kind and supportive and suggested that perhaps dating right now wouldn't be good for me. That gave me the fuel that I needed to actually break things off with Tom. I begged to come back to the ashram. I really wanted to focus and reignite my spiritual life. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare! So I did move back, but I think it was really because I was scared of being in the real world, so to speak. It was a different experience for me because I was no longer in management, so I didn't have the stresses that I had previously, but I still found it quite difficult. I needed to be more mentally engaged, but any sign of stress, I just I couldn't cope. This was when I started to take antidepressants to try and help with my mental health. I started to see a therapist. I didn't like them because they suggested perhaps I should stop chanting, <laughs> so I didn't trust them, and then I saw another therapist who criticized something about the community and again I didn't trust them. So I was very distrustful at that point of anyone who might tell me to stop practicing Krishna consciousness. But that meant that I couldn't actually work on myself and the issues that I was facing. Despite me being really angry and upset that these two therapists might have indicated that I should take a break from my spiritual life, I began to have doubts. I again had thoughts about leaving the community. But what would I do for work? Who would I hang out with? I dropped all my friends years ago, something that I deeply, deeply regret. But if I left the community, then I would be nothing. Who would I be? Those were the kind of thoughts that were going on in my head at that time. During this year, I was engaged in a fun service at Yoga Lounge. Yoga and philosophy. Combine the two and it's yoga philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> and that was it was a lot of fun. I was also involved in monthly yoga retreats. had heaps of fun doing some rap performances. I mean, the first performance we did, I did forget my lines. Can you notice? Needs education, it's a mystery to most as we go about our lives, sleeping, texting, eating, toast. We know exactly what we look like in a killer selfie. But do we understand this up? With a toy in the back at me. Now, we can't understand, folks, what I'm talking about. So we don't understand all this about. Come on now, listen to me. Listen to my girl, Sumia Mai. These girls are just, they're super talented. Obviously there were fun times, but I was really struggling and I couldn't bring myself to talk with anyone about it. My body did the talking really. My brother and his girlfriend, who's now his wife, came over to New Zealand and this was the first time that I'd meet her and I hadn't seen my brother in years. I did rope them into being in a video for me. I'm the doctor. Who are you? I am the master. No, you can't be. Oh yes I am. And these aren't ordinary fingers. 
These are shooting figures. <coughs> oh no, I'm a girl. <coughs> oh no, they're old. know that was based on Doctor Who which is a sci-fi TV show. As soon as my brother came I started having really bad bowel troubles. I'm not sure exactly what my subconscious was trying to tell me. I think maybe I was ashamed with where I was at, what I've been doing the last year or so, breaking up with Tom. I'm not entirely sure. But as we were driving up to my Nana's 90th I just kept on needing the bathroom. So my brother eventually just took me back to my mum's uh, and as soon as I got there, I was fine. My dad and stepmom also came over for the 90th, and they were both really worried. We did come up with an idea of me possibly going to Krishna Village, which is a Hare Krishna yoga teacher training center over in Australia. It was kind of just quite close to where they lived. But I didn't end up doing that because I just couldn't face leaving the community. I don't know why. A few more months went by, and we had a ladies retreat, which was really nice. But then I just snapped. I needed to get out of there. So I went to Australia to do the yoga teacher training. It was a lovely course. And I was really interested to see a different flavor of bhakti, so to speak. I met some lovely devotees and found that Krishna village was so, so beautiful. I became really close with another student on the course and she reminded me that I can be loved and that I can see beauty in life. I am forever grateful to have spent the time that I did with her. They're really fond memories. I also cut my hair short for the second time because I just wanted to change again. I had intended on staying longer and volunteer at the next yoga course, but my grandfather was really sick and I decided it was more important to support my mum because I hadn't really been there for her when my grandma died. So I moved to Auckland because I just really wanted a little bit more space. I also decided to stop practicing bhakti to work on my mental health. I was lucky enough to have family friends in Auckland who I stayed with for a long time as I slowly got back on my feet. They were so generous and kind and I am so grateful for them and their support as I tried to just figure myself and my life out. I started to see a therapist at the beginning of 2019. It was really nice to talk with someone openly and honestly about my experience, especially because they just had no agenda. They were just there to support me without trying to make me stay in a religion or not. That's when my healing journey really started and hopefully a bit of growth. I got a job at a bank so what we can give, not what we get. and found that 2019 was a really difficult year because I had no community, I had no friends, I had no sense of purpose. I was constantly conflicted. Should I go back? Should I start practicing again? Should I not? I didn't know what to do. There was one point where I was really low again and wanted to end my life. I thought about it very deeply, but I could never act on those thoughts. But I just hated where I was at. I was completely lost. I eventually bought a car and for the first time actually felt like an adult. And I saved and I finally got myself some wheels. I didn't know what to do for work and I thought maybe I could teach yoga full time as well as make videos online. Good morning. Good morning dear yogi. Hello my friend. Kia ora. Come on in. It's our time. Kia ora. Te 
It's our time, our special time of day. Let's do some yoga together. It's time to blow the rust away and brightly meet our day. It's our time. Yeah, I should probably stop now. The family friends who I was living with at the time had moved their practice and I helped paint it and was lucky enough to get a little office space there. I wanted to start a business teaching yoga and as a freelance videographer. That didn't work out for various reasons and I also decided to study therapy, or specifically psychotherapy. I realized how much I wanted to help people, help support people who might have gone through a really difficult time like I had or am going through. I studied that for a year and had two more years to go but decided that perhaps being a therapist wasn't really for me. Uh, my mental health isn't as strong as it could be and I think it might strain me too much to hear other people's difficult stories as much as I'd love to help. I applied to be a teacher. Kia ora, my name is Lear and I want to be a teacher because I love to educate. I love to take concepts and ideas and represent them in ways that are easy to understand. I have a background in design and videography which I think will help me bring a lot of fun creative activities to the classroom. And got accepted but decided not to pursue that. I've since realized that I need a job where I can tick off boxes, see tangible results, as well as being physically and mentally active. So I still haven't got a career that I've actually settled on yet. <laughs> I'm currently a mental health support worker where I run health and wellbeing activities. Back onto the chair. Oh. Just after the big lockdown in 2020, I decided to get a dog. This is because I really felt like I needed something outside of myself to look after because I was not looking after myself. That was the best decision I've made. It was really nice because my mum also bought a dog at the same time who happens to be my dog's sister. <laughs> so they get to catch up whenever I go down to Wellington. My dog gives me so much love and happiness, which I really need at this time of my life. I've tried to make videos again since leaving, but my creative energy and drive has just been sapped. I don't have the same passion anymore, which is unfortunately what depression does to you. It removes joy from the things that you previously loved. But I'm on a path of healing and finding myself again. In 2019, I constantly had this mental turmoil. Should I go and be a devotee again or should I just stay and work on my mental health? It was, it was quite difficult to live with. It was actually when I went to Vietnam for my brother's wedding that I realized that I'd made a good decision for my mental health, that this was really good for me to reconnect with my family and myself and just be happy and relaxed. So that is me from the time I started practicing bhakti to the present. In the next video I will try and articulate the reasons why I left a movement that just seems so happy, carefree and joyous. Thanks so much for watching up until this point and have a good one eh? Some people say that rappers don't have feelings. We have feelings. Some people say I'm not a rapper. I'm a rapper and it hurts my feelings. Some people say that rappers can't be spiritual. I'm spiritual. What you're about to hear, a true reflection straight from my mind. I make some videos for the YouTube, trying to tell my story about keeping it true. I joined a spiritual community. I got a little hurt and stopped feeling free. Now you don't really know me from anybody else. Before you get to hating, take a look at yourself. Don't go blaming this or that. 
without even knowing all the facts. We can get caught up in all our feelings, take a look inside to know what it all means. Layer upon layer leads to decisions. I want you to make your choices with the utmost precision. Don't take things at surface value. All you gotta do is try and stay true. True to yourself as much as you can. That's always the intention, most often the plan. I got hurt feelings. I got hurt feelings. I feel so misunderstood. I don't want people thinking I've told a falsehood. I got hurt feelings. I got hurt feelings. Man, I was just trying to do some good. All I really wanted was to tell the truth. Didn't want to tell people what to do. My story was so I could express myself and to start conversations amongst yourselves. The world isn't simply black or white. There are so many shades of gray, it gives me quite the fright. Don't get caught up in a tunnel vision. Don't shut your family out for the mission. Keep your eyes open, don't cover your ears. Don't let anybody take control of your fears. This rap is really meant as a joke, but I'm hoping it'll help keep you woke. I'm a huge fan of the flight of the Concord. They're so cool. Na, 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 na. Man, it's kind of hard to rhyme with Concords. I got hurt feelings. I got hurt feelings. I felt so misunderstood. Didn't want to be sad for the rest of my adulthood. I got hurt feelings. I got hurt Feelings, man, I was just trying to do some good. I think that was significantly cringeworthy. I wanted to make the chorus of that song to be the start of video seven, the final video. I got hurt feelings, I got hurt feelings. I feel like a prize asshole, no one even mentions my casserole. And then I just started procrast 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 procrastinating, procrastinating. But then I started procrastinating and uh, wrote a whole song. It made me laugh and I had fun doing it. Since I haven't actually finished the final video yet because it's, it's, it's been quite elusive, I'm just not able to craft it in the way that I wanted. I thought I'd just make this video for a little bit of fun and share it with you. Also, since you stayed to the end of this rap, it means that you must be somewhat invested in the journey that I've been sharing over the last six weeks. So I thought I would ask you for some questions and I'll answer them in a Q&A video. I'm sure the last six videos or perhaps the whole channel in general has brought up some questions for you. So why don't I specifically answer them? All you gotta do is comment your questions below on this video and if there's enough engagement, I will make a Q&A video. That could be something interesting I'm also working on another video which talks about cults because I can see that my use of cult in this video series has not been appreciated by a lot of people. So I kind of wanted to address that and really break down what a cult actually is. More specifically, what a destructive cult is. Now I don't label ESCON or any Christo communities as cults in this video. It's more that I, I give some specific guidelines as to what a cult is according to research and leave it to you to make your conclusions about whether something is or is not a cult. Me working on that video about cults is probably why I'm a little bit delayed with video number seven and why it's not really coming together how I wanted but that's all right there will be another two or three videos to come. Thanks so much for watching and have a good one eh? We've made it. We're finally at the finish line of this series. The finale, the, the juicy part, maybe. I'm so excited! You might have noticed that I've been very careful as I tell my story. And this is because I want to honor the great experiences and connections that I did have in the community. I love and respect so many of the people there and I don't want them to feel like I'm saying It's all your fault! I blame you! <laughs> I want to be respectful of those relationships but I also wanted to be open about leaving especially given that I had a channel 
uh, with lots of videos where I promoted my lifestyle as a Hare Krishna. We don't simply hit the streets, dancing around to the beat. This lifestyle is very scientific, some may say quite specific. I don't blame anyone per se for why I left, although some things could have been done better. Things that happened to me definitely influenced my decision to leave. But obviously the way I personally responded to those events also influenced why I left. It's never one thing or one person, I've found at least. Layer upon layer leads to decisions. I want you to make your choices with the utmost precision. It seems from the comments that some of you have found my videos really helpful. And that is amazing. That makes me super happy. I'm really glad that you can connect with and possibly learn from my experiences. All I really wanted was to tell the truth. Didn't want to tell people what to do. My story was so I could express myself and to start conversations amongst yourselves. But I also want to stress that please don't take these videos as a lesson not to ever join an ashram or have that full-time spiritual experience. Obviously it's not for everyone, but I don't want you to dismiss it just because of my experiences. Because I actually think it's a, it is a really cool opportunity. So there was never just one reason why I left, though the most prominent was because of my mental health. Through this process I've also realised why I wouldn't return, which has settled my mind a lot because I was in a lot of turmoil of should I stay or should I go kind of kind of thing like should I go back or should I not. I'm finally peaceful in my decision. It's just taken two and a half years to get there. So I've kind of narrowed it down to seven significant reasons for why I've left. Number one, unhappy. I was quite unhappy. As you might have realised. I was unsettled for a number of reasons. I felt like I couldn't breathe properly. I began to see that I'd gone into bhakti with gung-ho, youthful energy. I was going to change the world. And now that kind of youthful enthusiasm had subsided, I realised I needed to step back and really see what it was that I wanted in life. I wanted to understand why I was so depressed. Number two, grooming. In my first year as a devotee, I had an inappropriate relationship with a male devotee. Now, I wasn't particularly clear in that video that he was, in fact, married. He was twice my age and he had been practicing bhakti for like 14 years at the time. That experience was the fuel that drove me to work harder and feel like I had to prove myself, show my sincerity. So it was totally inappropriate that he took an interest in me. The experience haunted me for a long time because I didn't properly work through it or understand it. And that's something I've been doing the last year or so. What was really difficult during that time was I, I, I just often wonder what it was that he saw in me. It was kind of like, why me and not anyone else? Why did he seek me out? I certainly wasn't the prettiest girl in the ashram, nor the most graceful or elegant. Sometimes I would just think that maybe he thought I was the most vulnerable. The, the, the easiest to manipulate or the weakest therefore the easiest to groom that's what my therapist and a psychologist called it grooming so yeah that was the foundational layer of why I left number three normality I think that's a word being normal honestly there was a big part of me that just kind of wanted to be normal be part of society I wanted to be spiritual but also part of society. I wanted to go and meet friends who weren't necessarily devotees and just hang out, relax and just have a bit of fun. I didn't want to have to worry if there was garlic or onion in the food that I ate or have at the back of my mind this guilty feeling whenever I ate food that wasn't cooked by a devotee because it would ruin my spiritual life or I wouldn't be as pure as I should be. I just wanted to live guilt free as well. I wanted to hang out with my family and enjoy their company without these niggling thoughts in the back of my mind. I went on a trip with my mum to Niue. I read so many different books on Ayurveda, self-help books, meditation, and I really liked reading them. I really liked reading uh, these different world views, these different ways of seeing myself and others. I found myself actually relaxing and feeling normal. I really liked it. Number four, lonely. I was lonely somehow living with 16 other ladies. It was like I wasn't close with anyone because I couldn't be 
truly honest with how I felt. Obviously I had friends, but I felt like I couldn't really open up about the struggles I had or the doubts that I had. And that was either because I was ashamed or they were quite new to Bhakti, so I didn't feel comfortable, I don't know, maybe causing doubts with them or <laughs> bringing those kind of questions to them. Uh, that's because I saw that they just had this youthful enthusiasm that I used to have and I didn't, I didn't really want to take that away from them. <laughs> I always felt that we were often looking out, outwards, trying to bring people in without really focusing on the relationships already there. I mean, that's how I felt. <laughs> you might disagree with it, but it doesn't change how I felt. Number five, chanting. In those last few years, I was really struggling with my mind and I found that chanting was actually becoming super stressful. In my first year, it was the best thing. I loved it and I found so much solace in it and energy and enthusiasm from chanting. Now it was hard. Sometimes I would express my difficulty with management services and get the response kind of like, I would just chant more sincerely, you know, focus on your japa, which isn't the kind of practical advice I needed. So I actually started almost resenting chanting because I was told that would help me, but I didn't have the faith or didn't have the belief that it would. And this confused me that I was so resentful of chanting because I knew that in this day and age, chanting Hare Krishna is the best way to connect with Krishna. So then why did I dislike it so much? Why did it make me anxious? Why did it make me, yeah, just anxious? It almost became like a trigger for me, especially when I tried every so often to start chanting after I left. It just, as soon as I did, I would feel stressed again. Um, I'm talking about japa, I'm not talking about kirtan. Kirtan is always, it's always something that I hate love and it really makes me feel connected to Krishna. So that, that, that connection's never gone. Number six, rules. Around the time that I was dating Tom, I really, well, definitely at the time of dating Tom, I began doubting some of the rules. Though, uh, those doubts started beforehand, but I really started vocalizing them with him during that time. I was gonna give you some examples, um, but I think it would just make this video too long and didn't seem necessary. Basically, there were certain things that we, we were supposed to do, especially courting or dating, um, that I didn't agree with and some rules I didn't understand the logical reason behind them and it, it niggled niggled and bothered me either I couldn't find a good enough explanation in the books when I tried looking for them or Maybe when asking someone directly it wasn't good enough. So yeah, it just started it started to bother me number seven Disconnected I felt strangely disconnected with myself. I didn't really know who I was anymore I had stopped making videos or being creative for just various reasons mainly my stress and depression, but also I thought that the best way to serve Krishna was through management and if I didn't do that then I was a failure. So that, 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 was, that was a whole thing and a whole internal dilemma for me for a while. I didn't like it when people called me creative because I thought that was a really bad thing. <laughs> because certain people viewed creatives as very unorganized and wistful and like They'd get distracted by a shadow, and that wasn't me. Um, but they were wrong. I'm artistic, I'm creative, and I own that. And I just now ignore those comments. Disregard them, should I say. So I felt that I needed to find myself again without the influence of the community, without certain opinions. I just needed to try and be as true to myself as I can. So those are the seven main reasons I felt led to me leaving. Um, don't know what you think of them, to be honest. It took me a long time to, to put those together for some reason. But that's cool. They've come together. I still care for the ladies in the ashram. Very much. Like a big sister, kind of. I think Bhakti Lunge is an awesome place. It's pretty cool. And the ashram is also a really cool place for that foundational spiritual training. A senior devotee did once tell me that the ashram is like a kindergarten. 
uh, but you've got to remember that there's still you know school high school and university or college wherever you're from so it's 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 that that starting ground that foundation but it's not the be all and end all kind of thing it's useful for some not necessarily for others I unfortunately just had this warped view that it was everything if I wasn't in that single ladies ashram doing full-time service then I wasn't really serving Krishna that was my mistaken view my naive uh, view what I wish I learned in the ashram was the importance of nurturing and developing my relationships with my fellow devotees there that is in my opinion the most important thing I've realized if I can't develop and maintain loving relationships with devotees how could I possibly do that with Krishna now I know that there are a lot of you who have had similar experiences to me and I know that some of you really want to talk directly to me and just share stories I've given you these videos and that's all I can offer I can't offer more of my time these videos were a process for me to understand what happened and I'm hoping that they'll help others um, who might be going through something similar but also I'm kind of I'm leaving them in the past I'm, I'm moving on now I'm happy to talk to people who I have met in person while I was a devotee that's that's cool but not people I've never met and I hope that you can get from my videos what you need and that you can maybe reach out to other people you know and, and, and talk about your experience I'm sure you understand so this video is the last in the series thanks so much for following along I super surprised about how many people have been following along I'm hoping to do one last video talking about cults what they are and whether ISKCON or communities in ISKCON are cults but I'm not sure I'm not sure how I feel about that I've written and rewritten it so many times we'll see on that one other than that video this is pretty much it for me in this channel I might make a video every so often but I actually have other plans for this channel nothing set in stone yet but I'm hoping that at the start of next year someone else who is really cool will start making videos talking about bhakti I just want to keep the content going really so watch this space hopefully there'll still be some more content in the future bye for now and have a good one eh? something's been bugging me these last few days I've been I've been a little bit sad I guess you can say this is all very unscripted unthought through so I'm just seeing how we go here um, and I can't quite understand where it's coming from and I think a lot of it is probably to do with me making this video um, I was always really concerned that I would possibly hurt people in the community that I was from from making these videos that it was a direct kind of insult to them but for me it's really a process for me trying to understand what I went through in the last few years I think some people might be concerned that I wasn't I tried to be obviously as honest as I could there were so many things I loved about the community and yes I was super alone but obviously there were some people who really deeply mattered to me and were there for me or tried to be there for me and perhaps I didn't let them I think I've hurt one person in particular I think um, I know that when I moved out of the ashram um, the, the first time and I was living I was living with another Hare Krishna you know, a good friend of mine who we meme a lot so we flatted together for a few months um, yeah this girl you know she reached out to me I felt everyone ignored me and kind of forgot about me but she didn't and she went and <laughs> she actually went and stayed the night with me once when uh, my flatmate was away and she really showed she cared and that my relationship with her has always meant a lot <laughs> to me um, I don't know why I'm so emotional about this <laughs> I guess for some reason I feel like I've lost that friendship for some reason I don't know why um, we're in two different worlds she's going through a lot of changes and I had always wanted to be there for her 
while she's going through these changes. But now I don't think I can be, I guess. And I don't know where we stand. I don't maybe I'm just being super and mm. you know, she's got her own life. <laughs> and I just I guess it just thinking about that relationship, not knowing where it's at. And just thinking about the other relationships lost, you know, it's, 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 it's like a grieving period. <laughs> it's like I'm breaking up with all these people in a sense. Again. <laughs> um, but that really hurts. <laughs> because although I don't want to be a devotee anytime soon, I still love those girls. <laughs> I feel so protective of them. And, uh... <gasps> um, it's just confusing. <laughs> this one person... I thought that we would, <laughs> you know, raise our kids together. <laughs> Not together, obviously. You know, we would have kids together and teach them about Krishna. <laughs> Yeah, we were best friends, so. It still looks like I'm running out of camera space. It's time to say goodbye. And it's taken me a little while to figure out how to do that. The original intention of this channel was to share the life of a Krishna. But naturally things change. Like the fact that I will no longer be making videos on this channel. But that doesn't mean this channel will stop. Ishri is going to start making videos, I just, I just won't be in them. I will also be making more videos, but just not on this channel. I'll be making a new channel and creating videos for the sake of creating. Just just for the fun of it. Golf is a pretty strange sport when you think about it. We use these sticks to hit these balls. And get it into that little hole. The main thing I've really asked Ishfri to do is just keep the previous videos I've made. I think it's really important to show the reality of someone's spiritual progression. Some people stay on the path and some people don't. So I think it's really important for those videos where I talk about leaving to stay. So I'm going to end this video the same way I ended the first Krishna video I ever made. I hope that made sense. I don't know if it did. I'm going to go have a swim. Hurry, Bo. Yeah, I probably should have mentioned that I'm actually on holiday in Fiji, so um, I'm going to get back to that. Have a good one, eh? Well, I mean, it's done. I've, I've contemplated doing this for years, um, but always got too scared that I would just turn around and change my mind. But because I'm giving the channel this ish for I, well, my mind's already made up kind of thing. Just trying to let go. It's not really let go, it's just more move on. I don't know why this was so difficult. Moving on! New life, new me. Crofton Downs resident Leah Spears Hutton is the mastermind behind this really super bright initiative. 
and she's with us now. I can't believe it made the front page. Look. Leah, what was the inspiration for this? Why did you kick this off? Uh, so last year actually I visited my nana up north in her retirement village and there were some villas there and we were walking around and they had all decorated their letterbox and I just thought that would be an incredible thing to do back home 